in the last couple of weeks, we've been inundated with news from Intel. We're not only talking about manufacturing, but also some of the future in research. I'm gonna go through them with you now. A lot of the content on this channel wouldn't be possible without you, the supporters. Many thanks to all who support, and if you're interested in supporting, then we have Patreon, we have a merch store, I have a Substack newsletter, or simply just like and subscribe. It really does help out the channel. So this first one is a bit of a doozy. What power do we see chips today running at? Your consumer chip in your system, in your PC, maybe 125, maybe 200 watts. Your GPU, anywhere from say 150 up to 300, 350 watts. Enterprise CPUs, enterprise AI ASICs. These are going up to four, five, six, seven hundred watts right now. Where is the fundamental limit? Well, as part of a DOE program called Cooler Chips, I'll explain what that means down below because it's a very long acronym. But this is a bunch of money that's given to a variety of projects. I want to do a larger video about it. Designed to aim to go for efficiency and cooling in modern processor design. Now, Intel, as part of this fund, has got one of the projects. It is only $1.7 million, but it is for three years. And the purpose of this fund is to go and research better cooling methods for two kilowatt processors. That's more than 2x what we see today. Now, on this channel, I've already discussed a paper by TSMC about cooling 2.6 kilowatt processors with direct dye liquid cooling. The purpose of uh, this research grant here is to go towards the two-phase uh, liquid immersion cooling. So this is where you dump your whole system into a vat of liquid. The liquid evaporates as the system heats up and as it runs, and then that liquid condenses. And it's the act of uh, evaporating and condensing that causes the flow of the liquid to help with the cooling. Now, this money is going to go towards uh, computer simulation of the best way that heat pipes can be in those sorts of environments. Right now, we're used to heat pipes in standard coolers being just very flat pipes that have some sort of integrated liquid that does uh, rapid evaporation and condensation. With this research grant, Intel is looking at more coral shaped 3D, uh, 3D environments, 3D situations that can effectively help in the efficiency of that cooling. When it comes to data centers, we're always talking about the amount of energy emitted by data centers and how can we reduce that in the future. Two-phase liquid immersion cooling is one of those routes, but the goal of the project here is to, re is to increase the efficiency of that immersion cooling by 2.5x. However, there is a big but, and I may do a, a bigger video on this, most Immersion cooling today uses PFAS chemicals, that's perfluoroalkyl substances. These are currently under severe scrutiny because they are toxic and they are long lasting in the environment. It's gotten to a point now where Facebook, uh, Meta and some of the other hyperscalers have stopped researching uh, systems based on them altogether. 3M, the bar largest manufacturer of these chemicals for semiconductor industry is going to stop manufacturing them in 2025. So it's kind of interesting that Intel's being given this grant, despite the fact that PFAS are on their way out. However, if it means we have a better heat pipe design from when we're all encased in some form of liquid, uh, then it might be useful in the future as uh, research into newer liquids that aren't PFAS, that aren't fluorofluoral alkyl substances come into the market. This is a very strong area because this is one clear way we can drive efficiency in the data center. Next bit of news here is talking about transistors in the 2030 and beyond time frame. Right now with transistors, we mostly speak about FinFET designs. Transistors that have gone three-dimensional in order to improve power, performance, air, and density. We are about approaching the new uh, gate all around FET design. Uh, I've done plenty of videos about this on the channel where the whole uh, gate is surrounding the channel and again, this drives power performance uh, and uh, density. Beyond that, we know that there is research going on to deal with fork sheets, which is a variant of uh, gate all around FETs. Then, then we've seen research also on complementary FETs where we go into sort of a more stacking method. You have N, N and P on top of each other, and that has uh, 
manufacturing difficulties uh, simply beyond making the transistors. Beyond even that, going further into the future, is this concept of 2D transistors. And the research right now is done specifically around molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide. We're talking about monolayers of, um, basically of a metal, of a, of a combination metal, uh, that act as a transistor, that also provide high mobility, that um, improve, again, power, performance, area. And the announcement that Intel's done recently is, a is essentially a memorandum of understanding. It's a research collaboration with CEA Letty, which is one of the big research houses here in Europe, uh, to go and be able to produce and manufacture these 2D transistor monolayers on full 300 millimeter wafers. Part of the problem here is that the production methods of uh, these 2D monolayers often require high temperatures, about 700 degrees C, and those temperatures can interfere with other processes in the uh, transistor manufacturing. So they're looking at ways, A, on how to grow them on full 300 millimeter wafers, and B, if there's a way that they can grow, uh, essentially grow them and transfer them onto um, a standard silicon wafer, without having to rely on that uh, massive heat requirement. Uh, there's no indication here in, in the announcement of how many people are being involved in this, whether there's any money involved, what the time frame is. We are talking about transistors in the 2030 time frame based on the IMEC roadmap. Again, one that I've done a video on, we can see, you can see a link, there'll be a link somewhere, uh, where these 2D transistors are kind of looking into the 2036 time frame. Uh, we're, we're dealing right now with N7, N5, Intel 4, Intel 3, and then the sort of angstrom era of 20A and 18A and 14A. Uh, we're talking here more like 2A. So that's just how far along the line it goes. So staying with manufacturing, there is a new agreement that Intel is going to build a assembly and test facility in Poland. In, uh, in what, what, how do you pronounce it? Wrocław. It, you know, spelt Roklaw, but pronounced Wrocław. This is a $4.6 billion investment, essentially bringing assembly and packaging uh, closer to Intel's European expansion goals. Part of the problem with today, assembly and packaging, we know that Intel has facilities for manufacturing in Israel and in Ireland, but if we want to go assemble and test uh, those wafers, they need to be either shipped to Asia or America, uh, which is obviously not great for things like energy consumption and distribution. So this is part of securing more of a European supply chain, keeping it very close to the facility, uh, the manufacturing facilities in Ireland and the new one that's coming up in Magdeburg. Uh, $4.6 billion uh, is gonna be a lot. It's gonna be interesting to see here what sort of subsidies Intel is gonna uh, go forth from the European Commission and from Poland. But we're starting to see building more of this use of European manufacturing uh, assembly test uh, going on to, towards that sort of 20% European target by 2030, I think that's the goal here. Oh, I will add the goal is for it to be operational in 2027 and it should provide around 2,000 local jobs. Staying in the same area, we have the Intel Magdeburg facility. Intel purchased the land officially in November 2022. However, there's been some uh, questioning in the media as to whether this is actually going to go ahead. Intel is apparently asking for a lot more subsidies than it seems that the German government or the European Commission is willing to provide for such a facility. However, uh, the, an updated agreement has been signed between Intel and the German government, and it's waiting for European Commission approval, which is going to expand the initial idea of this Magdeburg facility. Now, previously, it was going to be essentially two football fields worth of clean room space, um, either on leading edge or leading edge minus one uh, node. The idea is that if you have a, you know, this is Silicon Junction or Silicon Valley for Europe that can essentially provide chips to the automotive market. And then along with Poland, having that assembly and test facility uh, nearby, and then Ireland basically means that this investment is going to go above and beyond what was initially announced. Uh, now, the thing here is that this has required more investment from Intel, and in return, Intel gets more subsidies from Germany and the local government and the European government. How exactly that's going to play out in the grand scheme of things? Um, we've already seen Intel, you know, share the cost burden of, say, the uh, Ohio expansion with an investment firm. Not sure what's going to happen here. 
but the whole Magdeburg facility is again meant to be operational 2027-2028. Uh, around about 7,000 local uh, high-paying jobs, that's the goal here. We really, buying the land is good. We really need to see essentially a shovel in the ground. Pat's been talking about, you know, buying and building shells uh, to a point where he can then, if, if uh, equipment is needed, it can be installed. Uh, maybe that's more focused on Ohio or Arizona, but there's potential for that also to be here in Germany. So we really want to see tools being moved into a shell, and it's going to take a, a good... 12, 18, 24 months before we get that shell in place before tools can go in. And that's when we know that this project is really going forward. And the last bit of news from Intel recently has been quantum computing related. So I've been doing a bit of quantum computing content on this channel. We mostly talk about the uh, superconducting qubits uh, that we have to call to essentially 10 millikelvin in order to get to work. Intel used to be researching that. Uh, that kind of research has kind of gone away. Now they're looking into what they call spin qubits. So spin qubits are interesting because they're the size of a transistor and you can use standard CMOS uh, manufacturing techniques in order to build them. As a result, they have the potential to scale so much more within a single chip compared to other types of qubits that I've spoken about again on this channel. So what this news here is uh, essentially Intel has made a chip for research and academics called Tunnel Falls. It is spin qubit. There are 12 qubits on this chip that uh, can be entangled in between 4 and 12 gates, I believe they said. And they're working with two major partners, and the first labs to participate are going to be Sandia, Rochester, and University of Wisconsin-Madison. And the point here is essentially having a chip where uh, universities can do quantum research, either in quantum algorithms or actually in the fundamental materials research in order to get them to work. Uh, Intel, one of Intel's big goals as part of Pat's IDM 2.0 is to have more access to some of this uh, you know, research-based silicon. As, and because Intel has some of the leading manufacturing processes in the world, being able to drive that through offering availability. And part of this quantum chip, aside from the quantum aspect, is the ability to expose more students and more academics to leading-edge manufacturing. Uh, it was really interesting to hear that this uh, Tunnel Falls chip was actually built in the D1 fab in Oregon using EUV. So they're already using EUV to produce uh, quantum spin uh, qubit, you know, 12 qubit chips uh, on wafer. And they also said they had like 95% yield as a result. Um, they didn't say how big the chips were, though given that it's uh, EUV transistor sized and there's only 12 of them on the chip, the chip is pretty small. I mean, I've probably been showing up videos all through me talking about this or at least pictures of the chip that they've provided. Uh, so it is, it is kind of small, uh, but we're going to see how well this goes. Comparing to other uh, qubit chips out there, IBM has just announced their 433 uh, qubit chip. They've been using their 127 and their 27 qubit chips quite extensively across the world. We're still in that phase of, um, you know, what's the commercialization opportunity here? We've just seen quantum utility exposed by IBM for the first time. And it's going to be a long road to building that ecosystem of quantum computing. And Intel wants a piece of that pie. So literally the day after I recorded the rest of this, Intel has two more further announcements I should probably add in here. First is that they're selling a minority stake in a nanofabrication business. Uh, the business is called IMS, uh, Nanofabrication GmbH. And uh, they make multi-beam mask writing tools. Um, the whole point of this sale is, well, Intel is obviously looking to divest some of its uh, business interests in order to raise capital for its uh, IDM expansion. And this sale of approximately 20% of the company values IMS at 4.3 billion. So we can assume that Intel is making about $1 billion out of this deal. Now, this is really interesting because multi-e-beam uh, technology is used in EUV lithography. Um, and it's used in the mass creation for EUV. The fact that Intel is divesting itself here as part of its interests, even though it retains a controlling state, is uh, indicative of kind of where the company wants to be as to the, to the point of the build-out. If you need capital in order to do your build-out, maybe you have to divest it out of some of these businesses. Um, the business is being sold to Bain Capital, and uh, it will uh, the business will operate as a standalone subsidiary of Intel uh, under its current CEO, Dr. Elgar Blatzgummer. 
should point out here that this company is going to be critical in terms of the future of EUV and high NA EUV mask uh, development because uh, during the second half of this decade, we're going to see the rollout of high NA machines and there's going to be a high demand for mask production. Uh, Intel is, uh, is saying that this gives the company opportunities to grow. Um, a few other people have analyzed the situation and says that this is actually, you know, it, on the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter much because Intel retains a controlling stake. But, you know, everybody thinks about the vertical integration of these technologies into companies and uh, foundries like Intel and the fact that they own less of this company. You know, on the face of it, it doesn't seem to be that bad, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. The second bit of news that I managed to miss out of uh, recording this video is uh, that Intel has finally finished installing Aurora. Aurora is a supercomputer containing Intel CPU Max, that's Sapphire Rapids with HBM, and lots and lots and lots of Ponte Vecchio accelerators. Now, Aurora at the Argonne National Lab is, we expect to be number one in the top 500 list of supercomputers next time that comes around in November, with Intel stating that they uh, are going well north of two exaflops. Judging by the amount of uh, accelerators they've already stated is going to be in this system and also the teraflop number of the accelerators they're going to use we actually predict about 3.3 exaflops however that would assume that they're all running max at um, max tdp all the time which is about 560 600 watts uh, we actually think that these might be running slightly slower or might be slightly frequency reduced just for efficiency reasons so the real number is going to be more like 2.5 2.6 uh, that, that's a peak number the max number should be relatively near that, we hope. This is big because this is uh, essentially the system that Intel promised to deliver back in, or at least the tender went out for it in 2015. And we initially thought it was going to be, it was initially announced it was going to be Xeon Phi, then the future version of Xeon Phi, then the future product. And now it's finally here. Intel has taken some hits as a result of this agreement. There are some penalties for delivering late and late and even later. Uh, however, Intel's come through that. The system is now delivered. This is, I believe, Patrick Kennedy's already posted somewhere north of 1 million bits of silicon in this supercomputer. It's going to be used for a lot of accelerated computing in the sciences, in fundamental research. Uh, so, no, it's not a big AI machine as much as people might want it to be. It may do some AI in the future, but no, this is more for scientific compute. In fact, it's going in one of the national labs. I'm hoping that at some point Intel does tours of the facilities. They've shown us, you know, rough, uh, rough systems that are, you know, designed based to showcase what the Aurora design is going to be. But we actually need a, you know, a full tour of the the system, the full twenty thousand Pontevecchio chips, if I recall correctly, uh, that has gone into this thing. Uh, but yeah, really interesting that it's now complete. Finally, it's been a long, long road uh, of us talking about Aurora. And Intel now has one of the main exaflop uh, systems. Uh, we just need to wait for November for uh, the top 500 list to come out where we expect it to be number one. And that's assuming nobody from China decides to post their machine. So yeah, Intel's been in the news a lot recently. And rather than do a separate video for each of these, I just wanted to string them all together to let you know kind of how Intel's doing. Um, Obviously going to be a lot more throughout the year. I'm looking forward to a few IEEE conferences, Intel's presenting at Hot Chips as well. So stay tuned on the channel for that. And thank you for watching.